Hello, everybody. Nice to see you all today. Yeah? Yeah, perfect. Um, hi there, so my name is Quentin Johns. Uh, I work for a collaborative working space in central London called the Hub Westminster. Uh, we're a community of about 560 social and environmental entrepreneurs. Um, and I basically became interested in this a long time ago when I used to be a retail consultant working in the toy industry. So it's making informed consumer decisions with big data. Um, essentially, as an individual, as a consumer, how we make informed decisions. Well, there's a number of things. If you just want to flip through these, a couple more. That's it, perfect. So we choose things through our ethics, our values, our health, the location, uh, the amount of money it costs, maybe some religious beliefs. And that's how we make these decisions to buy things. Go on another one, add another one. Um, but we each, as individuals, have our own way of making these decisions, our own spectrum and kind of plethora of decisions to make them. And we end up with a mammoth amount of big data and us sat there going, wow, how do I consume all of this? Um, so it becomes incredibly difficult, especially when you've got this number of products and you buy them all on a kind of daily basis and you maybe make 100, 150 different consumer decisions you know, per week. Now that's an awful lot of information to compute. We'll go on again, you end up looking like this. Um, a guy called Roy F. Baumeister came up with a really interesting uh, theory, which was called decision-making fatigue. Um, essentially, after a certain number of decisions, the quality of your decisions start to deteriorate. Um, but don't worry, even judges suffer from this. So Roy F. Baumeister did this study, and he found that judges make better decisions in the morning. Try and get a court case in the morning. Um, what, what is that? Quite what my computer's doing. You can unplug the, uh, the sound. Okay. Um, but yes, so everybody suffers from this. So you imagine at 4.30 on a Friday afternoon, you go to go and choose your chicken dinning, and suddenly you're a little bit tired, you really want to get home and you wouldn't do it. You aren't quite fighting for the chicken civil rights that you would um, at 8.30 in the morning where you want your free-range chicken, and you pick up any old chicken and you end up going against your own kind of bed. Um, so here's a few things that I use to try and make ethical decisions on a daily basis, whether it's Greenpeace, Boycott, which is a fantastic app, Food UK, which tells you about health. I try to buy from social enterprises. We do all of our procurement at the Hub Westminster, mainly through social enterprises. Uh, Amazon reviews, great place to find out some kind of real world reviews of things, and a, a plethora of other things. I have about 70 odd apps on my phone, which causes my phone to die very regularly. I have to go through about six different things, scan with red laser, scan with boycott, do all of this. It gets quite time consuming, even using these time saving kind of methods. If we go on, um, I would rather be sat at home in my, my study, which is a bit like this, and use all those things to make those decisions before I suffer from the decision making fatigue or forget the phone, to get the phone out of my pocket and so on and so forth. If we go on. And then you make a whole load of logic games. Believe it or not, this is a whole load of open data uh, parts that are to do with various different parts of the internet all coming together, and they should all be able to interact with each other. They don't quite as of yet. But what I would like to see is a world where I can use all these different things so that I can sit in my study and decide, okay, I, I want to use these ethical standards. I want to use these reviews, which I think are trusted kind of principalities of, of ethics and values. Um, and I want to combine all of those to tell me more about that, but allow me to make better choices, basically, if we go on. Um, so we're lucky, though. There is a company called GS1 um, who invented barcodes a very long time ago. It revolutionized uh, kind of the retail industry in many ways. Um, and what these are is basically unique identifiers for each product. Uh, so, in, in case any of you are interested, I found this fascinating. The first one is a number systems character, so like a five is a consumable product, so forth and so on. The next one is a manufacturer code, um, and then you have an pr individual product code, and then this is a check logic, which basically adds all of these up. Uh, so this is a unique identifier for almost every product that is traded, uh, which obviously isn't fresh, or so on and so forth. If we go on again. Um, and then comes along this guy, Philippe Plagnol. Now, the thing about GS1 as an organization, <coughs> international organization, 
Uh, they are related to uh, the International Standards Organization, which has offices in every country in the world. And essentially, what they do is they have a closed loop system. So you have to buy into using the GS1 data. And they have about 260 different fields that you can fill out. Uh, now, currently, only manufacturers and distributors can fill out those columns. So you make a new product, and you sit there, and you fill out a column, and you say, OK, here it is. Here's my, uh, you know, my can of Coke. This is how many milliliters it contains. This is where it comes from, and so on and so forth. Now, only people that pay can then discover what those are. Now, they, on average, 40 to 60 of those columns are being used by manufacturers and, and distributors. Um, but they predicted there's going to be a 400% increase in the amount of data that consumers, i.e. you and me when we go into the supermarket, start to demand. Um, and they don't quite know how to do that because who's going to fill them out? Actually, the manufacturers and distributors don't have a great deal of incentive to fill out lots of those things to say, actually, we're terribly destroying the environment. Uh, you know, it's just not in their interest. So there's, there's uh, lots of change which is going to happen there. Um, so Philip came up with a great idea and actually found, and this is the line between what is open data and what's not, that you could scrape the internet and find out the barcode. You could find out lots of these details from Amazon, ASOS, a whole ton of other things. He's now got about two and a half million products into his open database. Um, there's, there's three or four other people that are doing this. Unfortunately, um, Philippe is uh, moving to Hong Kong and didn't find much appetite in, uh, in France, where he's from, um, for this kind of open database and faced a lot of kind of uh, trouble. So if we move on, so the, the Open Knowledge Foundation, Impact Hub Westminster and Provenance uh, got together and said actually this is a project that we'd really like to take on and continue. Um, so we are, and if you carry on, this is what we've got, this is the product open database. You can follow us on the open product data. And the idea is, go on one more, that we can actually take all these different things that I use and relate them all into one database, where you have a single database where you can see a barcode with the unique identifier, and then you can see all the different columns and how they're scored on those, making the, making the data much more accessible to you or I. Now, of course, anybody could use these, and anybody could have a column. The EDL could have a column for um, how British something is. You know, to, anybody could create their own, but then we choose what our <coughs> principalities and values are, we choose which columns we're going to use. Um, now, how does this fit in? The idea is that you no longer have to suffer from uh, the, this decision-making fatigue that when you go up and you look at the label on the back, rather than just seeing a label which tells you the ingredients, if you're looking through Google Glass, this could actually show you a product passport, which would display your own individual um, codes on the back. It would tell you what the Amazon reviews were, how many of your friends have bought this product, you know, how long it lasted, what, what Greenpeace recently rated it, how ethical consumers said it was getting on. And this can actually start to create uh, much better, much more informed consumer decisions, and we can actually start to use you know the, these kind of wearable technologies to start to influence real behavioural change, a kind of you know grassroots moment by moment decision making uh, uh, process. Uh, unfortunately, you also need the other thing. This only really becomes really powerful when you think that you've got whether it's a pebble or whether it's your phone with RFID on it or whatever the next generations of these things are, that it actually tracks what you're buying, when you're buying it, so that at the end of a week, you can get a report emailed to you which says you got four out of five stars for your own ethical rating. If you'd have swapped this product and that product, <coughs> you would have got five out of five stars. How do you feel about that? You can publish that, you can tell people about it, and hopefully this can start to make some systemic change in our consuming habits. There's another aspect to this as well, which is actually two forms of feedback loop. One of them is that it can go to the manufacturers and say to the manufacturers, actually there were 100,000 people that picked up your product this week and went to buy it and chose not to because of this column, this column, and this column. If you weren't destroying the Amazon, if you weren't using dyes that are polluting rivers in India, if you weren't using Bangladeshi uh, factories that were underpaying their staff, these people would have bought it. But you did, and that is exactly the reason why people didn't buy it. That becomes really powerful. Now, of course, there's something else that adds on to the back of that. How can this all be funded? The possibilities are that actually advertising or narrow casting, which is what Google used to, to send you the right adverts, you can then set your own parameters rather than Google. 
continuously showing me engagement <laughs> rings because I said like to my friend who recently got engaged, it actually shows me products that fit my own ethical codes. You know, it can actually show me things that I really want to buy by my, my ethics and stop me from getting tempted by you know, buying something else that it happens to flash up. Good thing, bad thing, good thing for me, bad thing for them. Uh, that, that's my interpretation anyway. If we go on. Um, we've got two events running around this on the 23rd of January. Uh, if anyone is interested, and uh, we, you can find them on my Twitter as well. Um, the first one is opening up product data, empowering consumers with open data. Uh, we're having a whole day-long event where we're hoping to pull in lots of these data sources and discuss what the architecture for lots of these things should look like and how we should move forward with it. Uh, it's really going to be a planning day for the next kind of you know, three to six months of this project. We're trying to get people in, in a kind of very open and transparent way to give them their own opinions. Hopefully we'll have lots of people represented. And the other one is transparency in the future of retail. How openness powered by technology will change the way we buy and sell things. Uh, this will be an evening event where we actually discuss the future of retail in a lot more detail than uh, the six minutes or half an hour possibly can, um, and really go into some detail with lots of really interesting speakers. So do have a look. And I think there's one last slide before I remember. Oh, that was just a thank you. Thank you very much, guys. Please do follow us on Twitter. And um, I would like to introduce Amisha, who's going to talk some more about these issues. And then you had other other companies stepping up and saying, well, you know, 
we're not massively involved with that factory, but we are going to help and we are going to invest money into this and we're going like, to um, be part of the compensation program. And there's just um, there's no requirement for big brands to actually be sharing all of this data. But if they did, it would, it would help hold them accountable. It would give us, the consumers, power. It would also create more kind of learning and sharing and collaboration in the industry. And then for smaller brands, there's a huge opportunity to share and to learn and to, to kind of help change the industry. Because if you're trying to make the industry more reliant on values, on understanding the natural resources that we have available to us, on ending slavery, then you need collaboration and you need, you need sharing of information and of knowledge. So here are a few examples of how this idea of open is being used in the fashion industry and transparency. So the ethical fashion forum is a good example, not an obvious one, but um, I, I used to work for the ethical fashion forum and was quite involved in the early days and it actually started as a round table discussion of, of a group of different designers getting together. And just sharing information openly, you know, which factory are you using, Wh where did you get this fabric? In fashion, that was unheard of at the time, and it still is in most areas of fashion. But within the sustainable ethical community, there's a, a feeling that the more that we help each other, the more that we you know, give power to the suppliers, the manufacturers that are making, say, ethical fabrics, the more we can make it the norm. And so the Ethical Fashion Forum brings together thousands of industry professionals from across the world, all just openly sharing information and helping each other. And that's really, really inspiring. Another example is Honest Buy, which is a fashion brand by Bruno Peters, who used to be one of the head designers at Hugo Boss. And um, he set up this label and decided to make it the world's first 100% transparent company. Now, he hasn't done a lot of, so this is, um, if you look at one product, this is the level of information that you get. So not only all of the material information and the manufacturing details, but the price calculation and everything. So there's no secret <coughs> as to why that garment costs what it does. But it, that is a lot of data for anyone looking to <coughs> get through. It's great that it's there, but I'm sure most people don't actually want to read that much. They just want to buy something that they like. So it's, it's, but it's a great, it's great, and they're doing really well. And actually, there has been a huge appetite for this idea of transparency and what he's doing, and a lot of brands think about how they can do it. Um, another example is the Nike Making app. So this is on the more on the manufacturing side. Nike created probably what's the world's biggest um, open database of sustainable fabrics, and. Um, Got, it's full of just information about the fabrics, where you get the fabrics, how they work, what they're best used for. And this app is available to anyone. You can download it, you can access information about these fabrics, you can add information to these fabrics. And it's designed so that small brands, so that designers, makers, can actually access the information that Nike have been able to research. So it's an example of them trying to help the industry. Um, and this is another example of kind of openness in a, in a different way. This is a tale of things, and this is this is a, a really old, this is an old kind of picture, but the sort of the idea of the QR codes and being able to scan as Clinton diligently does and find out information about product when you want to buy it. And the most exciting example, in my opinion, but um, full disclosure, I work on this project. <laughs> Is provenance, which I'm going to pass over to my colleague Matt, who's going to tell you more about. That's a beautiful segue. Um, <laughs> um, so, uh, my name is Matt, and I'm one of the co founders of Provenance. So, earlier this year, uh, me and my co-founder Jesse were having a long and very languid Sunday lunch, and uh, we were both talking about how little uh, we knew about the things we buy. So, for example, how many of you in this room know for a fact that what you're wearing wasn't made by a slave? Anyone? One in 80 people. Um, and then we were kind of quite surprised by that. So we, what we're also really surprised about is the number of headlines coming out in the last 12 months that were basically saying how terrible manufacturing was. Uh, 
as you can see, has been discussed widely. Uh, last 12 months, it's not on here, but the biggest fatalities in the global garment factory industry happened in the last 12 months. I mean, that was a pretty terrible thing. So, if you go to the next slide. Well, we knew loads of makers who were doing incredible things and making incredible things and were really proud and open about what they did and how they did it. But there wasn't really any way of them to shout about it above the noise of greenwash and big corporations trying to kind of squash this kind of sort of burgeoning maker movement. So, next slide, we made problems. Uh, it's about four weeks old um, and uh, I'm just catching up in my sleep at the moment. Um, and what it does is allow makers to tell their true stories. And what does that mean? And that means for makers to... Sorry. Um, <laughs> it allows makers to open up the information about where they make things, out of what and by whom, uh, and using that information to connect with shoppers in more meaningful ways. So, um, and we found that these are not just products and stuff, it's also storytelling. It's also a much more emotive and more powerful way of connecting with shoppers. Uh, through being proud and being open and honest about the things you're buying. Um, and we found that shoppers are really into this kind of thing. So this, you know, one in six people in the UK make ethical decisions about the things they buy every single day. Um, and the ethical industry is massive by 2016, 76 billion pounds. Um, slide. <laughs> uh, and also the maker movement is huge in Britain. Uh, year, we've had the uh, last three years quarter on quarter growth in manufacturing beer. Etsy added a million new makers uh, in September alone. Um, and there's also a huge amount of storytelling. We see there's $859 million of pleasure Kickstarter projects thus far. Um, and so there's a huge kind of burgeoning movement about it. But the gap between makers and shoppers is the biggest it's ever been. Uh, so what are we trying to do? So we're creating a place for makers to do that really simply and really effectively. So as a maker, you create a profile and you can add product by product, but for each product, they have to have, as a minimum, made in, made of, made by. Now, for things like the garment industry, that's a very simple way of dealing with the problem, but we think it's a start. Uh, and for shoppers, as Misha pointed out before, with things like honest buy, like all that data is meaningless for consumers because they've never been used to having that much information at a point of purchase. So what we thought we'd do is take some baby steps towards providing that data slide. Um, and so what it does, it allows shoppers to explore products by different metrics from price and brand and color. Um, and what we've found since we've been launched is that a sense of place has become really important for consumers. So the one thing <coughs> shoppers seem to do when they go on there is go to where they either live or have lived or where they are from. And they go and find things that are made in those areas. And that's never really been done before. And we've found, and so, so we've worked out that place is incredibly important. Um, and so behind all of this, what's underpinning all of this in our relationship with Quentin is open data. This whole thing is built upon this, this giant idea of open data. And what that means is that every piece of information that gets added to the platform is open and accessible to anybody. Um, so next year, we're going to be releasing an API of all the information that we've gathered. So you can pick it up, sort it, build apps on it, do whatever you like with it. Um, because we think that's the only way you're going to really build trust and uh, transparency in an industry that's riddled with mistrust and misleading information. So this is the team. So this is I match. This is Jason. Jesse's a uh, supply chain specialist, and here we have a crack team of developers, uh, storytellers, photographers, and Anisha, uh, who's an entity all on her own. Uh, and slide, and that's it. No problems. Speak to you. Okay, so uh, my name is Leo Theoden. Um, I make open source 3D printers. And uh, I'm struck by considering how my the things I make would fit into prominence. So there's a great big supply chain behind some uh, sort of ever uh, made by made in is such such a blunt instrument how do we, how do we get data that you know the supplier for my supplier's supplier does this yeah yeah uh, that's a really good question um so when we were kind of trying to work out what to build to start with what would be the bare bones of this idea 
that's where we got to the made made up made by. Mm. Obviously, things are far more complicated than that. Um, and what we're going to do next year is building those features. So one of the partners that we're working with is SourceMap, which is open data supply chain mapping. And what that does is it allows consumers to find really easy and quickly that, that supply chain. Because the moment supply chains are complicated, convoluted, and they're buried in spreadsheets and silent, hidden away from you. Yeah. Um, but we want to make that meaningful, and we want to make that easy to digest and simple to use. So the next iteration is going to have much more power and tools to allow that level of complexity to start to kind of come through and start to kind of reach the consumer. Just like I say, if I, if I have that information, I'd start <coughs> putting it into my decisions for the things that I put into my products. But at the moment, that's fallen off the end of a long list. Yeah, how do you get that? Well, I mean, I think that's a good thing. It's about highlighting where the gaps are. So, and then if you're then saying to your suppliers, well, it's really important to me to share this to share this information forward, can you find out? And if you're showing them a map that's got like a question mark on it and something like, help me solve this question mark, when you're just asking, yeah. it's not the same, but we're hoping that this kind of process will, it will just generally encourage more openness and more transparency. And obviously that's a, that's a revolution that we're trying to create. So yeah. there's a long way to go, but um, this is the beginning. There's, a, there's an interesting project called Open Desk, um, which is the CNC milling for uh, kind of Creative Commons desks. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're just working with the idea of actually building QR codes into, into each design that gets printed. Um, so you can get the design, you then send it off to be printed at a CNC machine. And what they do is they take, pro they take pictures of the product at every stage. So you can actually scan the QR code and it will show you who the designer is at the top of the stage, uh, top of the page, who the intermediary was, who the CNC milling company was, and show them actually milling your machine. They take a picture as they first start cutting it, who the delivery company was, you know, they take a picture of it being loaded into the van with the license plate on it, and then where it was delivered to, where it was picked up, and you can keep on adding to that. So we've just had a delivery from them that's come to us from the Science Museum. So if you look at that product page, it goes down to it being displayed in the Science Museum, then it goes there. So imagine if you could track the history of you know, your second-hand clothes and you scan it, and not only can you see the supply chain, but you can see who owned it before you. Um, so the possibilities of that kind of narrative storytelling, which is simplistic because it's a fairly small supply chain, but at least it's done. Uh, I'm Daniel Robin from the University of Newcastle. Um, I'm very open to this, uh, or I'm very keen on the open movement, but I'm wondering to which extent it would not be more efficient to bring the issue of tracking the provenance of the different components and to address it at the, at the political level, for example. Good question. Uh, so, we, so we believe that the buying is more powerful than voting. Uh, and if everything you buy is a vocal world kind of what you want to live in, it's far more immediate as well. Because so the political process, I've had I'm a journalist by training, I've had dealings with politicians before, and it's a clusterfuck of mess and bureaucracy and you get hidden and siloed everywhere. But if someone doesn't want you to do something in politics, you'll never do it. Um, so what we thought was a simpler, <coughs> more effective, more immediate way is to empower consumers at the most basic point, that is the point of sale. So if you start to choose things that have more openness and more and a better provenance and, and have sort of better ethics attached to them, then that's going to start a grassroots level and grow up. It's the same idea with the organic and fair trade movements. They started out as consumer things at a very kind of top end level. You had to go to very specific stores in West London to buy your organic coffee or your fair trade meats or whatever. Now that's ubiquitous, that's everywhere, that's in every supermarket, that's in every corner shop. And that was a consumer thing. And so now that's influenced policy. Uh, at a top-down level. And so that's kind of what we're trying to do, trying to start from the grassroots and go up rather than start from the top of the level. So I would add to that that like, any meaningful change has to have a three-pronged approach. And so there has to be legislative change and things happening in that area and industry leadership and change and consumer citizen leadership and change. But which, who goes first in which order? Like, you know, I think everyone just has to try and do their bit. So. I was just saying it in parallel with what you were saying is, I, mean, I think the thing about being a consumer is that, yeah, you, 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 you're completely clueless. You just, like you were saying, 
just end up you think, oh well I'll just buy this now anyway and have it it's there and you haven't got you, you know, and when you find out, like you said, the, the, the line where things get to, you know, it's like it could be a Chinese fabric but it went to France, it was made in France and then it's designed by an Italian and you know, by this time you you know, you don't know whether it's ethical. There might be a little bit of of it that's ethical, but I think you know, you're the same with the grassroots thing about you know, everyone's heard of, of organic ethical soil association thing now and it's just it literally was exactly like you're a bit a, a fringe movement. It's a complete fringe movement, like what you're talking about. Oh my God, that's weird. Yeah. Now, I, so I think it. I, 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 I feel very heartened by what you're doing. Because even if I'm in that industry myself, it's confusing. So, you know. Yeah, and then that's the thing. So, yeah, there's, there's always going to be fast fashion in some sense. There's always going to be cheap clothes. There's always going to be stuff made thousands of miles away. That's the reality that we faced. But however, what we thought was more meaningful, more powerful, was give someone a choice. Uh, give someone a choice between something that you know nothing about and give someone a choice between something you know lots about. And we think people are motivated by that idea that if, if a company reaches out to you and is very open and shares with you, then you're more likely to trust it than a company who doesn't do that. So it's all about giving people a choice. People can buy crap on the high street that's made terribly, uh, but they can also buy things that aren't made terribly or are made locally or have other sort of values and ethics that are more suited to you. But it's about having that choice. I think that's the most powerful thing. Interesting. Sorry. Related to that is that we've been talking to um, some people in Marrakesh where um, tourists go and buy things, thinking they're buying local products, supporting the local economy, and actually they're buying things that look Moroccan that were made in China. And so, when when provenance has more products on it and is more global, the idea that you could be in Marrakesh and you could like look at actual things that have actually been made around you and not just things that look like they've been made around you and that is a very powerful thing. I do also say that there's, this is where there's a big link to the kind of open data and actually sharing data because there are special interest groups that are interested in all of these things whether it's you know the, the copying of uh, kind of tourist trap souvenirs or whether it's uh, slavery, or whether it's the toxicity of certain dyes. There are individual groups, whether it's uh, governmental bodies, or whether it's uh, private organisations, NGOs, charities, individuals even, in the case of Philippe Plagnol. You know, th there are people that are interested in these areas. And if we all share that information uh, through platforms like Provenance, you know, then that allows us to not have to do all the research ourselves but develop trust networks where we say, actually, I trust this portal to give me reliable information. And then they become conduits for these kind of principalities of, of values, if you like. Um, I just wanted to raise, um, I was at a symposium um, about Petrov and the Chinese book that I was from in the first pitch, and it was like a symposium all about textiles. And there was a, la a lady who was making a film called Dirty White Gold. Yeah. And she spoke about that, and it's all about the cotton industry, and you know, like you might buy an organic cotton that you use with the seeds from, who plants the seeds they might have used, and it just made you realise that you just should know, you know, that once you start asking questions, and I think that that seems to be the thing. But um, but yeah, this film I thought was really interesting. But it's called Dirty White Gold. So, yeah. I think that's a really interesting question, I think, and because. Um, Everyone in this room at very different levels of understanding about fabric manufacture or manufacture generally and what's meaningful to you. Like for you, it might be organic, yeah, everything has to be organic, but for someone else, it has to be like no one died making this one. There's a million different values that we all have. And rather than trying to force a, a certain set of values down your throat as a consumer, we just thought, well, I'll just show them everything. And if there's certain things that do match your values and certain things that don't, then that's up to you to make that choice rather than us trying to say, you need to value this and you need to value that. And what we've heard from manufacturers is that some, like, so for example, things made in China, there are lots of really good factories who do really good work in China. But the thing is, they get all tied with the same brush. So what Chinese manufacturing's biggest problem now is an image problem. They're trying to change that. And so you start to see companies like Everlane you make all that stuff in China, but are very open and honest about it. And so it allows people to make their own choices of whether something made in China inherently is bad, or that some things made in China in some ways are bad, and some things made in China are good. And it's just all about this idea of choice and just being very open and honest rather than ethical.
sustainable. Yeah, quite like educational, transparent. Yeah. Like letting people make their own choices. Yeah, like, if you can ask the question, you'll find the answer, then you can make your own decisions. Yeah. But at the moment, it's like, there's no, you know, but it starts mm -hmm. asking questions, doesn't it? If everyone asks questions, then maybe we'll start getting more answers. We're at a point in history where, as, as citizens, as global citizens, as consumers, we've all got to step up because this problem is massive and we've got to take control and play our part. And, you know, it's not easy, it's obviously easier to, to not pay attention to these things and just go about your life, but um, it's our planet, so yeah, it's time for us to stand up. Um, it's a great app, and a really nice bit, but it seems to me it's really, really similar to the Blue Butter, Butterfly Movement and Positive Luxury, and then the Positive Luxury yep. .com. So uh, what you're doing to make sure that you are pooling resources with people who are doing similar things, um, are you opening up an API um, and forging partnerships, um, to make sure that the data isn't, you're not duplicating the work? Right? Yeah, absolutely. So now we're, uh, we've got about 16 data partners. Uh, who we're working with. So people like open corporates, which scrape companies' house data, and they give them to anybody. So if you're a company and you say you're independent and small, or a company's house you're owned by LVMH, that will get revealed. So what we've realized is that there's lots of people doing great things already in this space, and they're just kind of drawing a big ring around them all and saying, let's do this together. And companies like Positive Luxury, who we've spoken to already, absolutely, like everyone's doing their own little bits. And what we think is about, we, we can never do this on our own. And you know, there's, there's seven of us. Uh, we're not going to change this on our own. It is just going to be a massive collaborative effort between things like what Quentin's been working on and things like what we should be working on in our own space and doing it all together. Uh, and the idea of being open and honest, we felt was the most effective way doing that. Everyone just shares. Good. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you.